Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him ear, hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Now, a lot of you know me, so please don't laugh when I say this. Do you think I'm a Dave Matthews groupie? <laughs> The Dave Matthews Band has had staying power for a long time, and I've got to say, you, you know, music isn't really my thing, and, and, and I'm not much of a groupie. I'm really not. But over the years, I have had to work part-time uh, while I was a pastor, and um, one, one time I worked at a pizza shop down in Westfield, and um, I tell you, when you or my age, or was then, working at a pizza shop, you are around a lot of teeny boppers. And Jan's Village Pizza had a daughter that worked at the pizza shop. And she really wasn't all that young. She, she had a, a, a little girl that was four or five, but she hadn't quite grown up. And she was a Dave Matthews band groupie. And I'm telling you, she would come to work unless by some wonderful encounter she was able to get tickets. And then she would go wherever she was and wouldn't show up for work, the boss's daughter. Because being with a groupie being a roadie, oh, she loved getting close to the guys that were, were on the sound crew or whatever. And every once in a while, she'd travel with them, and she thought that was the best thing in the world. She got close to Dave Matthews. And it was kind of sad, really. It really was. But she was a groupie, and I saw that. I saw that nothing seemed to really matter. And yet, at the same time, she didn't really know Dave Matthews. She wasn't really anything special to the people she traveled with, but she was just insecure, and she wanted to belong to something big. I want you to know, the scripture Larry read tells me God is not interested in groupies. He does not want you to become a groupie or a roadie for Jesus. He doesn't. He, he says here that there were many people following Jesus. They were traveling with Jesus. They were going where Jesus went. And he was getting a big crowd. And to be honest, the crowd was keeping him from doing the work that he needed to do. He needed to thin out the crowd. You see, in our thought, Jesus will take anything he can get from anyone. And Jesus is like, no, I want to focus my attention on those few people who are willing to make sacrifices for me. And so Jesus uses something 
that every author knows about. It's called hyperbole. Hyperbole is where someone intentionally exaggerates something. And, and, um, and that's the idea... Um, that's the idea of hyperbole here. And he's saying that we need to have commitment. So the way in which he does it is that, that, that if you're to follow Jesus, you've got to hate your family. Hate your wife. Hate your father. Hate your mother. Why? Why don't you even hate yourself? Do you think... That Jesus saying, in order to be a faithful disciple, you really need to hate the people closest to you? Don't we have everywhere else in the word of God saying that family is important and relationships are vital? Of course. What Jesus is not saying is that, that you do your best work for me when you can't stand people. Instead, he's saying, if you really want to follow me, you've got to love me more than anyone else. There can't be a competitor. You, you, anyone that is between me and God is an idol. And that will get you in the way of serving me. And so hyperbole means that he got everyone's attention by saying, you know, if you want to follow me, hate your family. But what he's really saying is, when Jesus is number one in your decision making, he will really enable us to love those in second place more than if they were in first place. Want to be a better husband? Love Jesus. Want to be a better wife? Love Jesus. Want to honor your parents? Want to be there for your children? Find time for Jesus. Want, to, want Jesus to teach you how to be there for your brothers or sisters or the friend who needs someone to point them in the right direction? Try bringing them to Jesus. If you think you're a follower of Jesus because you attend his concerts, think again. Obviously, we don't get it. Jesus has a purpose. Jesus has a game plan for winning the world. And it isn't to register as a roadie for Jesus no, Jesus says, let's downsize. It's not that concerts and glamour and popularity are evil in and of themselves. It's just that it takes hard practice, long days, sacrifices in order to go to the cross. In order to pay the price on a lonely hill. You know what? Jesus redefines death. Death is no longer the last word, the permanent word. Resurrection not only is the plan for Jesus, but it is also God's plan for anyone who walks in Jesus' footprints. If you walk beside Jesus, you will walk into suffering and pain and death, and you will not stay there. Do you know, so often in grieving, we enter into pain, but we simply live the rest of our life stuck there. Jesus says, follow me, and I will lift you eventually, after a few days, into a place of overcoming, a victory. So... Jesus thinned out the crowd so that he could focus on the few who would have the staying power, who would be foundational in establishing his kingdom, his disciples. And now Jesus uses two very practical stories here, and I want to build on this. First of all, he talks about a building project. 
And then secondly, he talks about going to war. First of all, the building project. Before you actually start to build, you need to make some plans. You need to see what it's going to look like. You need to see how much it's going to cost. And you need to ask, can I do this? Can I follow through? Well, Travis McDougall has spent the last, what, year and a half working at Howard Park. Howard Park is going to be open to the public the day after Thanksgiving. Um, they have revamped that place, and it is going to be a community treasure for downtown South Bend. It will have an ice skating pond and also an ice skating path they call a ribbon, and there will be playgrounds for all types of people, and in warm weather, there's a splash park, and laughter, and concerts, and events will take place. It will be wonderful. Mark Tanner, the founder of the South Bend Chocolate Company, not only is going to have a cafe on site, but eventually there's going to be a Howard Park public house restaurant there as well or nearby. Um, Travis, before they broke ground 14 months ago, key leaders needed to consider whether $18.8 million was worth it or not. I'm sure that was an easy decision. <laughs> so they decided, yes, we will invest this money. And then they got people like Travis to put their hard hats on and to dig and to plan and to do all kinds of things. And now it's almost time to celebrate. And, and this wonderful expense hopefully will be well worth the benefit in that um, we get to be a part of having that treasure in our community. Well, in the same way, Jesus demands all or nothing commitment. Yes, our commitment will grow. Yes, it will improve. But our best will become better, but not until we say, I am determined. I am committed I will work toward this end. And so, Jesus' mission is found in Luke chapter 4 and Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, are you up for being part of that? Jesus said, my greatest commandments are these. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's commitment. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love demands a lot. And then in the end of um, the Gospels, he gives us a commission to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, not just Jewish people, to teach them to obey the way that God wants us to live. Now, get out your yellow pad, sharpen your number two pencil, and do the math of the kingdom of God. Is it worth it? For you to trade your whole life for these purposes... Is it worth it? You have to be all in. You can't be lackluster, half-hearted, part-time, complacent, and at the same time change the world. Won't happen. Hope demands an installment. Will you make that initial installment? The second story is a story of a battle plan. And this is even more important than deciding whether or not to build a tower. It's whether or not to go to war. It doesn't mean that the size of your army is the same as the size of the opponent's army. It means 
will you be able to, with what you have to offer, overcome the forces of the enemy? There's a war between good and evil. There's a war going on, a combat. There's a toxic power that wants to destroy, and God has great good in store for those who will believe in the kingdom of grace and justice and love. To sacrifice personal pleasures for significance and meaning, to help people win the battle, that is important. Now, I want to say this. Jesus doesn't say count the cost so that we would decide not to pay the price. That's not the idea. When we count the cost and we realize there's a price, we also become certain that there's a purpose bigger than ourselves. There's a benefit for getting involved. A benefit to you, a benefit from you to others. So he's not saying count the cost because he wants people to go away. He's saying count the cost so that we will together be an army, a team that will accomplish much. Well, this week I watched a movie called Listen to Your Heart. And there was a struggling musician, Danny, who fell in love with a deaf woman, Ariana. And she was from a wealthy family and her controlling mother wanted better things for her than to be with a struggling musician. So the mother did everything she could to keep them apart. And Danny had to figure out whether this young lady was worth the fight or not. And he determined, I'm not going to miss out on something great because it might also be hard. And he went for her. And he won her heart. I want you to know Jesus is worth the cost. And if, if there's anything or anyone more important than following him, then you need to change the order and the priority of your heart. If Jesus is the most important consideration, there's absolutely no reason to delay, stall, or postpone starting to build and starting to go to war for him. <coughs> Cost. You know why it's so important? Jesus counted the cost of your soul and said, you're worth it. So he was broken and he died for you. He lifted his body between heaven and earth. He stretched out his hand and blood flowed to the ground. And just as his blood fell on the dirt, so his life is able to cover the dirt of your life. Why do I ask you to give your life to Christ? Because he's already given his life to you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, may our lives be a symbol of gratitude for all that you gave us. And in return, may we follow you into death in order to experience resurrection. May we love you most and thank you that as we do that, you teach us how to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift 
that we have because you paid the price. Lord, when we take a step in your direction, may we do so knowing that there will be plenty of joys, but there will be sorrows and needs, and we will need to trust you constantly. But help us to know that in trusting you, we are able to live a life of significance and meaning the one to which you have called us to. In Jesus' name, amen.